So for those of you, for those of you who don't know, we are the Center for Cardiovascular Investigations at the University of Guelph. And so we represent uh, faculty and students all across the university through the Ontario Vet College, College of Biological Sciences, Biomedical Sciences, Clinical Studies, Pop Med, Molecular and Cell Biology, Human Health and Nutritional Sciences, and Integrated Biology. So we run different types of seminar series. These are cardiovascular scientist seminars, and the purpose of these ones are, one, to promote the outstanding research of our faculty, two, facilitate networking for grad students so they can work between different labs and programs from basic biochemistry all the way to clinical translation, and three, we want to attract the best and brightest undergraduate students to cardiovascular and health sciences, so we promote this in the undergraduate courses too and encourage students to come out and learn about what people are doing in research should they be interested. So it didn't really start this way, but it, we've sort of developed different themes and we tend to pair two talks a day. So it might be basic biologists with clinical applications or sometimes like you see today, we'll look at what happens in the human and we'll look at what happens in the animal. And so just a quick recap, the ones we've done so far, we had Dr. Tarek uh, Sala and Dr. Uh, Philip Millar who talked about pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals and how they affected sympathetic activity and stroke. We had Drs. Dawson and O'Sullivan talk about dilated cardiomyopathy, and so Dr. Dawson talked a lot about it at the biochemical level and the human genetics level, and uh, Lynn O'Sullivan talked about the Dobermans. Uh, then myself, Dr. Martino, and Dr. Pai, we talked about MI or heart attacks, and uh, ideas like circadian biology, sex and gender, and new therapies for treatment of heart disease. Uh, last time we had Dr. Simpson and Dr. Fanfara talk about everything reaching from cardiomyopathy to the development of heart failure and new clinical approaches to help both humans and animals. And today I'm really excited about the talks today with uh, Dr. Jane Byrne and Dr. Physix Sheard. We're going to talk about performance physiology both in humans and in racehorses. And since I don't get to introduce Gail, I'm especially excited to say thank you, Gail, uh, for coming today as the director of Equine Guelph and will introduce the speakers. Okay, just a quick reminder, we run a number of programs to help benefit leadership training in students, and that includes our 2017 Graduate Student Executive Council representing the different labs uh, that we belong to, and they provide key input decision-making for our center programs. So we can synergize with their needs, and as well, they help organize seminars and other events. And new this year, we have the undergraduate student executives as well, some of whom are graduating. So if you're an undergraduate student and you think you might be interested next year, uh, it's not very time consuming, but you do start to learn some leadership skills. And so please do uh, feel free to uh, email me if you want to uh, get involved. People who are new, come down and get pizza for sure. Just go ahead and take those veg and meat. Otherwise, we're gonna eat it all for dinner, it's for you guys. Okay, and now I'm gonna invite uh, Love Up, and Love's gonna make some announcements about Mandy Life Ride for Heart. Thank you. So good afternoon. The Guelph Cardiovascular Center is back again this year with Heart and Stroke to offer you a fun experience on the Traffic Free Gardener and DVP. We invite you guys to ride, run, or even walk in the Ride for Heart on June 3rd, 2018. It's a fun day, it's not a race or anything like that unless you want to, and you can even do it with your friends and family. So enjoy a fun day with us as you support heart disease and stroke research. So if you're interested in being part of our team, supporting, or even learning more about this event, please contact me at lsandu at uofguelph.ca. So now I have the pleasure of calling up Josh and Zikra, two of our CCVI student reps, to say a few introductory comments. Great, thank you. Um, on behalf of the Student Executive Council, we want to welcome everyone here today for the CCVI Cardiovascular Scientist Seminar. Uh, just a few things before we begin. Uh, special thanks, first of all, to the members of the Student Exec Executive Council um, and our undergrad reps, reps for helping coordinate the labs and promoting today's event. Um, one thing for you guys is um, please take photos, tweet photos, use the hashtags you can see on the screen, um, hashtag Guelph and hashtag CCVI. And please don't forget to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, importantly, we ask that people should remain for both speakers. 
We will hold questions until after both talks, at which point you are welcome to come down and ask any questions at the end. That way we, ha we can have both talks in the time permitted. Speakers will have 25 minutes for their talks. Please stick to your time. Our student reps will come stand up at the front, of, at the front to let you know when you have a few minutes left. Lastly, thank you to Biomed, OVC, and CVS for sponsoring the pizza lunch for today's seminar. We now have the honor of calling on Gail Ecker, Director of Equine Guelph, to say a few words. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and it is my honor to introduce our two guests for today. So starting off with Dr. Jamie Burr. He's an assistant professor in human health and nutritional science and the director of human performance and health research lab at the University of Guelph. Uh, we stole him away from the University of PEI in 2015 in a dual role as professor and member of the integrated support team for the local Olympians and elite athletes who live and train in Guelph with the Speed River Track Club. Uh, Jamie did his undergraduate degree in kinesiology at the University of Western Ontario, after which he did an MSc followed by a PhD in cardiorespiratory physiology at York University in Toronto and a postdoc at the University of British Columbia in experimental medicine. Dr. Burr's work shares a joint focus on the role of exercise for promoting health and improving human performance, focusing on the cardiovascular and cardiometabolic effects of prolonged and novel forms of exercise exposure in humans, with a specific focus on vascular flow and stiffness. So I welcome Dr. Jamie Burr. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me if I just speak like this? I prefer not to wear a microphone. Okay, great. If you can't hear me, just give me some sort of a signal here. Um, so thank you for the uh, welcome. That was very official, um, more than I normally get. So um, today I'm going to be talking about an area I've termed uh, going against the flow. And we're going to talk about some of the stuff that we do in the Human Performance Lab, um, mostly in terms of performance. So I want to start off by saying the Human Performance and Health Research Lab is not what most people in this room would probably consider your typical cardiovascular lab. So if I can take a, a bit of a shot <laughs> at some of the other people, um, because I imagine this is what goes on in Jeremy's lab. I haven't been over there to see it. I didn't think Phil was going to be here. And uh, Glenn was taking shots at me for my hair all week on Twitter. So um, there you go. We do, much like other labs that are here and represented, we do um, some mechanistic work in our lab. Um, we're supported by these types of agencies, which I'm sure many of the other labs are as well. Um, we're also very lucky that our lab lends itself to industry partnered research. So um, we do a lot of work through MyTax where industry will come to us with a question or a problem and we say, hey, that's something that we can look at and we can sort of help you with. So um, it certainly isn't an exhaustive list, but some of the things we've worked on recently are, are working with supplement companies that have ways they think they can change uh, metabolism or thermogenesis. Um, we worked with a company that thought they could deliver creatine through the skin instead of through the gut, which was an interesting project. Um, we've got some others looking at prototype devices. And uh, just as last weekend, we were actually up in uh, northern Quebec uh, working for the Canadian Council of Snowmobile Organizations. Um, I feel like this one needs a little bit of explanation. Um, so you can see here, we actually have, this is my postdoc sitting on a snowmobile here. On his back there, you can see there's a little computer. And so what we're actually doing there is we have these people instrumented with these masks and we can, we can measure exactly what's going on with metabolism inside their body. So in this case, the Snowmobile Society wanted to know, is this a real sport? Can we actually tell people there may be physical activity and health benefits and cardiovascular benefits from this as well? This actually kind of relates to today's topic. We were just um, chatting about how, you know, in equine racing, it's one of the few sports where you have an athlete on top and below. So, um, you know, this is certainly the kind of thing that we could apply to jockeys and understanding how, how hard is it to be a jockey? What, what's the physical activity expenditure? As mentioned in my introduction, uh, part of my role here at the university is actually working with Speed River. So we, uh, if you are not aware, we have many elite athletes that live and train in town. Um, we're quite proud that we sent eight, Olympic, uh, eight Olympians to the past Olympics from Speed River. So um, that's part of it. I put up there as well, you know, we're doing some stuff with Ultra Marathon. So we have the Sulphur Springs race coming up. We want to understand in that context what happens to the heart and to the vasculature when you go out and you run for 100 miles or 160 kilometers straight. As you can imagine, uh, things change. 
And finally, another part of um, our past research is working with hockey. And um, I've done a lot of work with the NHL and understanding how do we predict who's going to be good? Who should these teams be putting their money behind? So um, actually, if I look a little more haggard than normal, um, it's because we came from Quebec directly back to Toronto where we did this testing uh, earlier this week. So here you can see this is a, um, it's basically a robotic fishing reel. So we've attached it to that uh, player and we can have them skate and figure out how quick can they accelerate if we pull them back a little bit, how does it change things. Um, and here's just a little video showing what happens when we do, um, we're looking at goalies and how they move and how they react. So that's sort of the human performance side. So when I was asked to do this talk, um, I thought, <laughs> first of all, what should I talk about today? Um, but I, I was given the instructions, try to make it a little bit more accessible. It's March break. Um, let's make it sort of a a bit more of a, a lay talk. So I'm going to do this as a bit of a show and tell. I hope that works for everybody else. And so I started thinking, what are we doing in the lab now, or what, we, what have we been doing recently? So I kind of broke it down in my own mind to um, what we do in health and what we do in performance. And just to pop up a few of the projects that we have ongoing, which makes me question my sanity, um, <laughs> you can see that we have a bit of a mix. So we have some things that lie quite purely in health, some that are quite purely into performance, and some that sort of cross in between. So today, I've decided to focus on these. And I put that up there just so you can kind of understand the perspective that we're coming from. Um, and that these things are very much towards performance, but there is certainly some, uh, some health potential to what we're looking at as well. I'm going to steal this right out of uh, Dr. Simpson's talk, because I think it's an important thing to mention. The work I'm going to talk about today um, is all the heavy lifting is actually done by my grad students. So we're very lucky to have uh, a good lab at the Human Performance Lab. You can see there's sort of the breakdown. It, we started a tradition where we take this, this awkward picture outside every year. Um, and Dr. King, who wasn't there for the picture, I wanted to include him as well. So um, the work I'm talking about is theirs, not my own. So I want to start by introducing this idea of ischemic preconditioning. Um, and ischemic preconditioning, even though I'm going to talk about it in a performance point of view, is actually something we stole from medicine. So it's actually been quite well understood for a while that if we have an adverse event happen in the heart, you know, it's a plumbing problem, and one of the coronary arteries gets blocked, it's going to change the way the heart moves and functions, and eventually it's going to lead to bad things, cell death. From the medical literature, we understand that if you actually sort of plan this out in a lab, and you go through and you take a forcep, and you clamp off the blood supply to a certain region, and then you let it go, and then you clamp it off for another five minutes and you let it go and you do that four or five times, we can cause this really interesting effect that happens after that. So we can do it to the region of interest, like directly where that blood is supplying. We can do it over here to an area that's kind of close to the area that we might cause a heart attack in. Or, because in humans we tend, in my lab we tend not to cut people open, clamp off parts of their heart for obvious reasons. Um, you can actually do it remotely. You can do it to an arm or a leg, and we call this remote ischemic preconditioning, and it has the same effect. And what that effect is, is that if there's going to be a period of prolonged ischemia, or if there is a heart attack, it actually will lower the amount of damage that happens. So you can see here the infarct area, if it would have been about that big, we can actually reduce it substantially by getting the heart ready for that insult that's about to happen. No, <laughs> I was quite proud of that animation. Um, <laughs> the whole point of that was, we can actually start to use this and apply this in the real world, because it's not just about um, sacrificing animals and seeing what happens when we deal with our heart outside the body. We now understand that we can use that to save tissue. So if somebody's having a heart attack and you're in the back of an ambulance, obviously you should, uh, you should be giving them nitro and all these other things to try to prevent the ischemia. But we can also start to lessen the damage that might occur by doing something as simple as inflating that blood pressure cuff that's inevitably already on them a few times on the way. We now understand that it's not just about the heart. So yes, it's going to have an effect on the heart and we can prevent that damage, but um, to Dr. Simpson's talk again, it's actually going to affect all sorts of organs. So perhaps a bit of a morbid thought, but if, if you are a paramedic driver and you're on your way to the hospital and you're going to lose somebody, there may be value in doing this because their organs will still be harvestable. They'll, they'll be in better shape when you get there and they can be donated to somebody else. Or if you're having another type of organ failure, perhaps a better way to put it, um, we can prevent some of the damage to that as well. So it is sort of a whole body thing, um, but we really looked at this and said it, it affects all these organs, but it also affects other tissues. And when I say other tissues, I really mean muscle. 
Okay? So if we have these effects that are going to affect the metabolism of the heart and other organs, it's quite likely that it's going to affect skeletal muscle as well. And I think you can start to see the relationship to human performance. So then how do we take this idea of remote ischemic preconditioning and apply it to an exercise setting? Well, essentially, the idea is exactly the same. We're going to put a cuff on somebody. Okay? It could be on the exercising muscle. So if we're talking a runner, we could use the legs. We could use one leg. We could use two legs. Or we could use the arms. Because it doesn't actually matter where we do it, as it turns out. We're going to inflate the cuff for five minutes, let it go for five minutes, and cycle this through a few times. Um, so I want to start, actually, I'll give you one specific study here. Um, looking at swimmers, and I like this because it's actually a Canadian study, and this was one of the first to do it, and I like the way they approach it. So they found very high-level swimmers, so these are national and international level, and they were swimming 100 meters. So for those of you who are not swimmers, that's four laps of the pool, a regular pool. Okay? They can do it in about 59 seconds. So challenge yourself to think about could you do four laps of the pool. Yeah, it's pretty quick. Um, that's an important point, though, because that means they are... At, they're at almost optimal performance already. They're doing everything they can to be as good as they possibly can. Okay? And what they did is they took these athletes and they did two conditions on two different days. So they took a blood pressure cuff, they put it on their leg, they inflated it either to 10 millimeters of mercury, which would be a very light squeeze. It would essentially do nothing to change blood flow on one day. And the other day they did it up to about 220 millimeters of mercury, which is above systolic pressure and would stop flow. So in the one instance, it's a real effect, or it's meant to be. In the other, it's just a sham, okay? At the time they did this, most people had never heard of this before and had no preconceived notion of what should happen. If we look at the results here, so this is looking at the sham day. Um, what you can see here is the change in swim time, okay? And this is important to me because this shows that when they went and did 100 meters at baseline, they did a sham, then they said, go do 100 meters again. They came in at almost exactly the same time because they're that good, right? They, they should be able to come in at about the same time. After they did an ischemic preconditioning, come on you, there we go. We can see that there's this huge variation in response, okay? So I pick out a few things from this. First, I'm gonna point out that if we look at sort of the mean change, these athletes who are already very good, and you can see would come in under normal conditions at almost exactly the same time, the mean change was almost a full second faster, 0.7 of a second faster. That's quite massive. And just to sort of exaggerate that point for you, this is showing you um, in the 2012 Olympics where every athlete in history that won a medal would have finished when Michael Phelps hit the wall. So you can see here over time, um, so this is back, like this is around the 40s right here. So by the time Phelps finished, they would have still had three quarters of a length to go. It also shows you how fast Michael Phelps is. But to give you some context, if you could be one second faster, that's a full body length difference, okay? And if we look at some of these athletes, they got three seconds or more faster. That's a massive change in an athlete of that caliber. Um, and that would put you a full six meters forward or backwards, whichever way you want to think about that. So we're not talking about a small difference here, okay? The other thing I'm going to point out as a performance physiologist is it's neat to say, okay, here's the, the mean change, but I'm also quite curious to look at the individual responses. Because if I'm working with this athlete, that matters to me. This is something I sh probably shouldn't do with them because they got worse, right? The coach is not going to be my friend if I go, hey, let's try this thing. Oh, I made them a little bit worse. Um, but if I'm working with that athlete, then I would be a fool to skip doing that if it works every time. So to sort of jump forward, what do we now know? Well, we know that this works quite well. In the lab setting, we've seen that um, with high intensity aerobic exercise, we can change submaximal efficiencies, we can change power outputs, um, the time to exhaustion when we just say, hey, go as long and as hard as you can. Um, and there is some evidence, which is debatable, um, that fitness, VO2 max, may change as well. So we're actually sort of in our infancy in this field. And if you notice that that reference I just showed you, which was one of the first studies, is less than 10 years old. So we're really still trying to figure out where to go with it. So this is some of the work that we've been doing in our field. And I'll start by saying there is accumulating evidence that in, in aerobic exercise, this seems to work. But there's a few things that we still don't understand. One of them that we're struggling with right now that we've started to look at is this idea is, is it a real effect or is it a placebo effect? So as you can probably appreciate, if I put a cuff on you and I and inflate it to 220 millimeters of mercury, you know that I'm squeezing you, <laughs> right? Like that is a good hard squeeze to cut off flow. So it's pretty hard to blind people to what we're doing to them because did I squeeze you or did I not? Um, 
So one of the things that we've started to look at now is to try to figure out what is a good sham so that people might think they're getting a benefit, but they probably shouldn't. And what we're doing here is we're actually doing exercise trials, uh, time trials on a bike, and we're, we're using uh, therapeutic ultrasound because there is a common belief that therapeutic ultrasound should increase blood flow, and people will take that and say, oh, well then, blood flow went up, I should get better. Is anybody doing our study in here right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you exactly how we do that, but we are shamming. Uh, I pretty much gave it away. I'll just tell you now. Um, so what we're doing is we're actually making the ultrasound beep and stuff. We're rubbing gel on people, and it's not even turned on. So that will help to answer that question. Sorry if anybody just had to drop out of our study. Um, the other thing that we need to understand is, is this an optimized effect? So great, it works, but could we be doing it better? Um, and so we're starting to look at things like augmenting the IPC stimulus. So we, we're still trying to understand what is the mechanism that changes? What is it that goes into the blood that seems to circulate other places that causes this effect? So we're looking at things like if we exercise while we're cutting off the blood flow, just very light, getting the muscle moving, does that cause a greater effect? So we're using this with electrical stimulation, light walking on a treadmill, for example. We're trying to understand the temporal effect. Um, as often happens in research, somebody did this once and kind of went, hey, this seemed to work, and then everybody did the same thing after. In this case, it seems to be you do it, you wait about 10 minutes, and then you do the exercise and go, hey, was it better or was it worse? We, we are questioning what's magical about 10 minutes. If we actually look at the myocardial data, it turns out there's different windows of efficacy. So nothing really seems to happen for the first two hours, then it becomes effective, and then there's sort of a 24 and 48 hour window as well. So we're starting to question that as well. So here we are doing our cycles, we do an exercise test, that's sort of our normal thing. Well, what if we do this immediately, 24 hours? I didn't mean 28 hours, sorry, that was a typo, that's meant to say 48 hours. Um, and we start to look at, well, did we get better after a short period? If we do it and then do it again, then do it again, did we get even better than that? Uh, my PhD student Josh has been looking at what happens if we do this chronically? So we're very lucky at Guelph to have very high level runners here who actually want to work with us. Um, so one of the things Josh has been doing for the last two years is taking uh, a segment of the cross country team and before every practice they come over and see Josh and he hooks them up with these tourniquets and he runs them through these cycles. So we're asking the question, if you do this repeatedly, before training is the end result that you adapt in a better way. Okay. And finally, we're looking to understand, is this something you have to do before exercise or what if you do it during exercise? So if you're doing a prolonged type of exercise, let's say the marathon, what if halfway through the marathon you reach over and <laughs> cut off your arms because you're not using them anyways, <laughs> does it make the end of that exercise any better? And that's a question that hasn't been asked. We're also looking at that to understand um, What's the presser response and how does the body respond? As you can imagine, um, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world. Um, and is that something we need to be thinking about in how we use this with athletes? So I've told you about aerobic exercise, but we also need to think about anaerobic exercise because not all exercise is like Forrest Gump, right? Where you just start running and then you grow a beard and you keep going. Some of it is very short duration. So we can think about sprinters or maybe it's not just about running. When we think about most sports that many of us probably do or have done, they're short duration, right? And the average sprint is about 20 meters if you look at your, your average team sport. So if we think that this is sort of what we looked at to date, well, we're talking about sports that occur more on this sort of a time frame. Okay, they start and then they're pretty much done right away. Does it work? I'll tell you that so far, there's pretty inconsistent results. So there's some work that shows if we do repeated sprints, there may be a benefit to doing ischemic preconditioning before short bouts that happen one after another. But why do we see these inconsistent results where a lot of studies don't show it? Well, I'd suggest that one of the things we need to consider is the energy systems used. When we do aerobic exercise, we're pulling in oxygen, we're using the mitochondria to generate that. There's some evidence that it might have to do with efficiencies there. I'd also suggest that there's um, issues with consistency of the performance that's been done. So, this probably represents most of us, right? Where um, we are not elite runners. And if you look at a lot of the evidence that's out there, it's done on university students. So we approached that problem and said, well, let, let's answer this. Um, we have a very good track team here. So we went to the track team and we tested them in a few ways. First, we tested them on multiple days to say, how fast can you run this distance that we want to do? So indoors, they do a 60 meter. Um, we actually used 10 and 20 meters, which is just the start. We did a sham and a deception on these days. Um, so as I pointed out, it's hard, to, it's hard to fool people as to when you squeezed them and when you didn't. So instead, we just lied to them. <laughs> um, we, we confused them about what they should expect. Because you can imagine, if you don't understand this and have never heard about it, and I squeeze your leg and cut off blood flow, it's 
um, logical to most people that that might not be a good thing, that might be a bad thing. So we let them run with that. Um, <laughs> and then we looked at what happened um, in the conditions of a normal meet. So this is a, a thing that, you know, it's not a lab setting. Can we actually take this to the track and should we do this at the championships? This is a bit of a different way to express the data and I won't get into um, the stats here because it's not a stats lecture, but we use magnitude based inference, which is understanding um, people compared to themselves. So it was really important that we understood the variance about these people and what actually matters as a change. So most of you would probably recognize these as forest plots. Each of these are individual people and how they did. And this is our sham group and this is our, um, our experimental group. So the first thing I want to point out is if you look at the time scale, it is very, very, very small. Okay. This is approaching 0.1 of a second. Okay. So these athletes could repeat their performance very tightly. Okay. The other thing we'll point out is that very few of them get outside of this normal variation that we would expect them to have. So in the end, we conclude, if we look at the mean results for this, the sham had absolutely no change. We can see maybe it started to shift a little bit towards a performance improvement uh, when we did ischemic preconditioning, but it does not get anywhere close to outside of the normal variation we would see. So our conclusion is that it does not seem to work for anaerobic short distance sports when they're performed in one bout. Okay, and to finish things off, I want to talk about a, a slight variation on this idea of manipulating blood flow, which is blood flow restricted training. So instead of squeezing off the arms, the legs, and cutting off blood flow before we exercise, what if we do it during exercise? I know what you're thinking, these guys are nuts. This is what it looks like. Um, so here we're doing lower legs, and you can see tourniquets, and there's the, the pressure tubes, and this is the sort of thing that happens. I feel like I'm going to have a hard time recruiting from this audience after this. Um, that's not like a kid playing with a marker. That's actually their hand turning blue because it's deoxygenated. So if we look at what's traditionally understood for resistance training, it, it used to be believed you have to lift pretty heavy weight, okay, and you've got to take it to fail. And um, we're talking about 70 or 80 percent of your maximum capacity, okay? So if you can lift 100 pounds once, we're talking 70 to 80 pounds. With blood flow restricted training, we now understand that we can lift loads as light as 20 or 30 percent of 1RM and still see these changes in mass, in hypertrophy, and in strength as well. Um, so this could suddenly make very light exercise beneficial, which could have all sorts of practical applications for us. Um, and there is accumulating evidence that this works. I might be aging myself here, or dating myself. How many people remember these late night commercials, Dr. Hose? Yeah. Are they still out there? Awesome. I just don't stay up that late anymore. Um, so, I suspect, I'm going to go on a limb and say many of you are not in the kind of physical condition you're in, which is super buff, because you're using Dr. Ho's electrical stimulators, right? But when these things came out, that was the idea. Hey, let's not exercise, let's just zap our muscles and we're going to all look like the Hulk. Didn't really pan out. Why did it not pan out? Well, the truth of the matter is, if you're going to electrically stimulate your muscles to cause that kind of growth, I would have to zap you so hard that you are not going to put up with it. But we looked at this and said, well, if a light intensity stimulus works when we cut off blood flow, what if we start using stimulation with blood flow restriction? So just to give you a, a quick visual of what this looks like, um, this was from our prototype. So we have made a, we're, we're working on patenting a device here where we can actually cut off blood flow and stimulate the muscles at the same time. Um, I'll just show this really quickly. So that's what happens is the leg actually moves. So we're actually causing real muscle contractions. Um, and there it is. So we have different ways that we can squeeze the leg. That's a full compression pant where we can squeeze all the blood out of the leg, essentially. Or we can cut it off just sort of more at the source. Um, so what are the potential benefits to combining these two things? Well, I'd suggest there's probably quite a few. Um, we may be able to get muscular adaptations without repetitive use. So imagine if you've got a knee problem and you don't want to be doing this. Well, let's just target the muscles that we want. Um, certainly for our elite athletes, they spend a lot of time traveling. What if you could be getting a light workout on the plane and it actually matter? You're going to look like a total freak, <laughs> but it might be possible. Um, we could possibly improve recovery, and um, it's also possible that we could change cardiovascular demand. So um, if by doing this kind of thing, the body doesn't have to work as hard to support that because it's basically a passive exercise, then um, there may be value. I'm going to skip the CBC news thing here. So what did we look at? Um, this was actually Josh's master's work. Um, and we looked at body composition here using dual x-ray uh, absorptiometry. We looked at muscle signals, and then we looked at muscle strength. And so in short, what do we see? We looked at these as all different uh, components. So we looked at what happens if we only do blood flow restriction. You can see muscle mass doesn't go up. If we only use electrical stimulation, it actually goes up a little. But when we combine them, it seems to be better, and the control actually got worse. Um, 
If we looked at a sustained contraction, so how long can you hold something, an endurance test? You can see again, blood flow restriction, when we combine it with electrical stimulation, seems to be the most effective. And the same when we look at strength measures as well. So there's a lot of potential that this might be a thing that, that could be used in the future. I just want to clarify, that is not me. <laughs> so we've taken this now, and some of the things we're looking at in our lab is we're trying to understand where does this work in a rehab setting? You know, if anybody's ever sprained your ankle, you probably do a lot of uh, balance type exercises. If we cut off blood flow first, does it become more effective? We want to understand what happens with the way we recruit muscles. For those of you who have studied this before, we do it in a very logical pattern. We only take what we need. Does this change that pattern? We're looking to understand why does this work? Is it the fact that we've driven down oxygen tension in the muscle, or is it the fact that we're building up waste products? And we're trying to look at, we think it's clever ways to uh, separate those two things. For the first time ever, we're going to actually look at histology and understand what is the adaptation. Are different fibers adapting in different ways? Is blood flow um, supply changing? Are we causing angiogenesis? And finally, we're going to look at how does this apply to actually stopping atrophy in the first place. So if anybody's so inclined, we're actually going to be recruiting people to come in and we're going to put you in a knee brace so you can't use your leg for two weeks. And in about two weeks, you'll lose a lot of muscle mass. And can we stop that mass from disappearing in the first place if we use this sort of technology? And with that, I'd say thank you, and uh, certainly thank you to uh, past and present uh, lab members, and I'd be happy to answer any questions, I think, at the end.